Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 6 to 6.30 p.m. session of the 2017 Open Simulator Community Conference. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC17. This session, we have a terrific session called the Digital Art Museum. Our speaker today is Andrew Wheelock, or as you see in front of you, Spiff Whitfield. Andrew is a 20-year educator with a degree in elementary education. He is now a technology integrator who works with schools around the western New York area. Currently, he is the project director of the Islands of Enlightenment. This is a self-hosted OpenSim virtual world that offers schools the opportunity to create and explore history, architecture, and language arts through virtual simulations. Welcome all. Welcome, Andrew. Let's begin the session. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me again. I did an earlier session with my uh, colleague and good friend, Mary Howard, and we did something on uh, literature in OpenSim. And I just have to just, you know, say how much this conference in particular inspires me personally, because I get to see uh, so many great like-minded educators were I think a very exclusive club in the sense that I think we're, we're all pretty innovative beyond our uh, our typical education colleagues. <laughs> um, so with that said, I just want to tell you kind of my a little bit of my journey and the latest project that I've been working on and, and really in hopes to really develop it as we go to the future. So if you want some more about me, certainly you can, within the, the sched schedule, there should be the presentation that I'm sharing. So if you want to see that on the Google Doc that, uh, that I created for this, you can do that. Also, if you click the little cube next to my avatar here, you should be able to get some notes about me. Probably the most uh, familiar place you can get in touch with me is my Coffee with the Geek uh, website. I try to do a lot of interviews with uh, fellow like-minded teachers. And again, that's a way for me to, to keep inspired is just uh, learning from, from others. And I think, you know, even just beyond us, I think as educators, we do such amazing things and we don't often, I think the, the public at large doesn't know all the magic that happens behind uh, the scenes. And of course they should know because we're dealing with such a, a wonderful uh, group of young people with our students. So uh, let me just give you some background as to the Islands of Enlightenment projects. And again, if you go to uh, islandsoe.weebly.com, that's the main website. And again, that's within that card that you can follow us. Uh, I'll just give you the briefest of briefest kind of reviews of, of the Islands of Enlightenment projects. And so this will be hopefully a, an under five minute review of all the things we've been doing. But of course, this has spanned going on probably five to six years. These projects have been put in place. And again, within that, there's so many great people that have been uh, helpers and, and collaborators and colleagues and supporters, including, you know, my work at, uh, we call it the Winnie Rick and, uh, you know, the, the supportive managers I've had. And that, of course, always helps too when you have leadership above you that is willing to, you know, take a chance on a pretty wild and crazy idea. You really are grateful for that because it doesn't always, you don't always find that. So um, special shout outs to all the great managers that I've had that have supported my work. And also, I want to just say a shout out to the New York State Department of Education who gave me a grant that got uh, the got this kind of the funding going with this. We know that, you know, servers cost money and, and putting an open sim program on a server and having somebody manage that, you know, that's cost money and energy. So thankful to New York State Department of Ed for uh, seeing the potential in this project and giving me the, the kind of startup money for that. So, so uh, again, in 2010 is when this whole project kind of started and it started really with the, uh, what we call the understanding of the Holocaust project. 
Sim, and that was really meant to be a companion piece to the diary of a young girl, Anne Frank. And we recreated essentially the streets of Amsterdam, 1944, and within we created the you know the secret annex digitally, so kids could use their avatars and explore the annex and that sort of thing. But it was you know more than that, and in a sense that we also wanted students to explore concepts of the Holocaust as well. And the final two projects, I think, are the most powerful pieces for us, and that was one to become kind of a digital museum curator, so each student gets a chance to be a museum creator, create their own exhibit in OpenSim that displays their uh, learning from the Holocaust. It doesn't have to just be excluded to Anne Frank. It can be any any topic. And over the years, we have just countless different exhibits. And I think it's a great way to express information for kids. And it really was one of the powerful pieces for us. And again, you don't have to give kids so much of do this here, do this here. They will take it and run with it and create all kinds of magic. And that's really the fun is is and again you, i think that's where we have to convince teachers is let them create because they will surprise you with what they can what they can do and just uh you know going back to marzano's work in the 80s that's what we one of the true ways of of learning is kids expressing something in a different way so uh open sim building to me is is one great way to see what kids have learned because it lets them present something in a different way so getting back to the project, again, that was just one of the, the final pieces. But then one of the other pieces was a writing piece where kids have to create a reflection candle, basically an essay about their learning. And, you know, going into such a big epic event like the Holocaust, you're always wary, like, you know, we don't want to make it too much of a game where kids think the Holocaust was just a game. So we wanted to make sure that the the history still had that impact, and certainly Anne's diary had that impact. And when we had students write the essay, we knew that you know the kids were walking away with some great learning because they were expressing a real heartfelt, um, powerful ideas, images, uh, you know, and again, learning and concepts and 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 empathy as well. So. Um, that was really the the starter piece, and I was so grateful for that as a starter. Over the summer, I got to go to Amsterdam and see the the annex, and found that hey, you know what, we really did a pretty good job with it. That was my fear, you know, going over there. You know, we were basically creating from, you know, images, designs, you know, all of the things we could find on the internet and and history books, and we we did I think some really good justice to it. And one of the things I liked about it from the Amsterdam Sim is that, you know, when you go to the Anne Frank house in Amsterdam, all the furniture is out of the, um, the, the house, you know, because it was taken out after the war. So we were able to actually, in open Sim, by recreating that, we were able to actually kind of enhance, I think, the experience. So, um, so that was our first project. And again, that was uh, super powerful, super rewarding. Our second project, again, was with a group of teachers, but primar primarily Mary Howard was one of the big drivers of that, and that was the Heir of the King project. And that was a medieval role play, so we basically created a medieval village with a castle, and the kids have to work their way up, level their way up to the castle, and then when they get to the castle, there's a medieval role play in there, and they have to, there's a medieval mystery, I guess, kind of an Arthurian legend, you know, who's the Heir of the King? So the kids really have to use problem-solving skills. I got some local theater students to create the characters, so they did the full English accents and all that. So the students were able to kind of interview, in quotes, the characters who they thought was the heir, and they had to go back and kind of put the pieces together. So there was not only historical learning, there was a literature tie-in and then problem-solving there. So, And it was you know game-based. So definitely up the engagement level and that was uh, we did mostly with sixth grade and that led us into the third year with I think for any of you who've worked with kids especially you know grades 6 through 12 which is what these were geared towards when you let them go and again if if you're a Minecraft person or have even seen kids with Minecraft you understand the power and the passion kids have for building 
So that brought us to the learning by design piece uh, in Buffalo. There is a Frank Lloyd Wright home uh, called the Darwin Martin House, which has a lot of local Buffalo history, a lot of history of the you know the Depression. Uh, Darwin Martin, who was the owner of the home, wound up losing everything in the stock market crash. So. Uh, fascinating history about Buffalo, about Darwin Martin, and of course Frank Lloyd Wright. His architecture is so powerful in that uh, building, and they've they've restored it to its original uh, glory. Uh, so, and they've been a great partner in that. So we basically take kids to the Darwin and Martin House, talk about Frank Lloyd Wright's principles of architecture, and it's really you know fascinating because you know Frank Lloyd Wright. If if you're, you're you may or may not be familiar with it, but his you know, I can actually. I think there's a picture in my slide share here. Um, his architecture is so bold and so different and so American. And the the neighborhood that this house is in is all you know very um, two door style homes from you know European style architecture. And here's this home that's just so big and bold and so different. And Frank Lloyd Wright's real like architectural. Uh, for lack of a better term, chutzpah, uh, really shines through in that house. But it also gives kids a totally different perspective on architecture and, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright's use of uh, using natural elements um, or recreating natural elements within his homes was, was really fascinating. And the kids took those general concepts of Frank Lloyd Wright's and developed their own world. So that was kind of our, our third year. And again, if you saw Mary in my presentation earlier, she's done some things that are totally her kind of creations, which is really the ultimate goal of what I wanted to do is make sure that, you know, teachers were not only just taking what I've created, but what they can take um, beyond. So uh, that's been really great to see that blossom. So then that got me to thinking that, you know, architecture is so powerful and there's so there's those artistic elements then i was kind of looking for well how can i get the art community involved because so many artists of today if you look at say you know digital game design you look at movies everything is digitally created now and it's works of amazing art i mean the picassos of our day are in game design and movie creation as well as you know even just web design i mean there's artists talented artists, I mean, amazingly talented artists that are that are doing things. So why not get started with OpenSim as their platform to, to create? So that's where I went. Of course, I was a, uh, a C-plus student in almost every art class I ever took. And, and I can tell you my painful story of art. I love art, but it never rewarded me as far as, as grades go. So uh, I think... You know, what I see on paper may not be as uh, wonderfully artistic as everyone else sees. So I wanted to find a partner and, and, and a collaborator with that. And the art teachers that I talked to were all interested, but to be honest with you, they were all really scared to death of, of approaching a digital art, especially you know, in, in elementary and public schools. And you know, there's there's a couple different reasons for it. First of all, it's higher end technology. Second of all, for art teachers, I mean, they already have their curriculum pretty well established. They, you know, they they know what they know. They do what they do. They do you know magical things with kids. And so you know, why you know, why change things? I'm doing great things. I'm doing things according to the curriculum. So why take a chance on this? Um, and so again, that and again, I guess the general fear of doing something different, doing something that kids, you know, that they're not comfortable with. It was a big, was a big hurdle. So I finally found my collaborator and that is Sheila Cannon and she's a Fredonia art teacher, which is in New York state here. And you can see her picture. She, uh, I had her also helping me with a sketch note workshop and she was, uh, you know, she's getting close to retirement. Although to look at her, she uh, looks like she, she's about 20 years old. But she, um, you know, she, I, I saw her and I said, you know, she, I've got this, you know, wild and crazy idea for you. And she said, you know what, Andy, it's time for me to, to try something, to, to try something new. And she, you know, was scared. <laughs> I think, I, I don't think she would mind me saying that. She was fearful of the technology when I helped her work with it. I mean, she was 
she was very, you know, it was something, it was giving up a control that she had and she did it. And I was so just grateful for her to do that. So finding that collaborator you think is probably your easiest step. That's probably your hardest step. So um, let me move on here because I've got a few more slides to share with you. So step one is finding that awesome collaborator, which I did in Sheila. And let me just advance my slide. So then was finding inspiration. And again, for the art project, we also brought the kids to the Darwin Martin house. You can see it on the left. We also showed the kids across the street from the Darwin Martin house. There was what's called the Church of the Good Shepherd, which has some Tiffany art, stained glass art design. So we gave them that inspiration as well. And you can see the group of teachers that we had, some, some art teachers, some uh, tech coordinators, and, and some other, you know, just building people. Uh, we had a construction guy in there too. We're gonna try that with him. And so again, then it was really just turning the kids loose and letting them bring their artworks. So some of what they did was they brought the artworks they created and then created an exhibit out of them. So kind of combining the elements from the Holocaust project we did and then have the kids create their own exhibit in world. And then the next you know frontier in that is to have them you know do 3d creations and making 3d images as art and that's where we're kind of in our next uh, phase and what uh, we did this year was we tried to use some programs that would get them kind of developing in into that mindset of digital creation so we used um, sketchup google sketchup and we use co-spaces if you haven't seen co-spaces i would highly recommend it especially for young kids it really is a really nice precursor program for 3d uh, building and animation and they're really developing it. CoSpaces is really doing a great job. I have to give them some kudos for it. It's easy for kids to do. They can do it on a you know uh, iPad. They can do it on a computer. They can do it uh, on a Chromebook. So that offers a lot of different compatibility and they can also see if they have you know like uh, Google Cardboard they can see their creations in, in 3D. So uh, really fun to to use that as a great program. So, and again, there's other building programs, of course, Wings 3D. You know, Unity is going to be kind of a really higher end program for more, I'm guessing, more high school level. But um, so we've, we've combined some of those kind of standalone programs with the idea of bringing those in world so that kids have a little more flexibility of the things they've done. So that's kind of where we are now is to let kids create on that level and I think it's been a huge success I've just been overjoyed that of course that I got the collaborate collaborative spirit with with Sheila to come in I think you know any for those of us have seen especially K through 12 kids work with it and if you've seen kids on Minecraft you see the passion and the excitement and the engagement so um, this is this is an avenue that I really want to continue to explore and really create some more works of art for the kids. So I guess I've got a couple more minutes left. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those. And uh, thank you so much for, for listening. Any questions I can answer again, feel free to connect with me. Uh, I am on Twitter. I'll put my Twitter handle in chat here. Okay. Thank you, Andy. I am uh, scrolling up to see if there's any questions. In the chat. Okay. I'd be happy to connect with anybody who'd want to learn more or somehow collaborate. Always open to that. Okay. Good. So you've answered everyone's questions before. <laughs> even asked them that's wonderful all right well thank you everyone for coming out to um you can uh your uh, iste group iste group tell us about that very briefly yeah uh iste please feel free to join us it's uh again i think it's ven network so v-e-n-e-t-w-o-r-k at weebly dot weebly dot com feel free to join us there we have events every Tuesday evenings. Uh, one is a writer's workshop. 
The other is a um, you know office hours. Then we have a machinima night, a focus series, and we have a machinima night. So every okay. Tuesday there's something going on. So yeah, join us there. I'll, I'll put it in chat as well. Okay, and then there's one uh, looks like a brief question: Are your projects open for use by other teachers? Uh, I am open to collaboration. How it works, because I'm a New York State entity, we really need to work with New York teachers, but we do have it where if you want to, say, partner with one of our New York teachers, and they're they're great teachers and they're always willing to do that, uh, we've been able to do that. So basically, the you know, you'll partner with a different school or a different teacher and we'll, we'll try and get you to like work through the program there. So yes, the answer is yes. Okay. And then there is one other question um, about covering Moodle, but I don't think we quite have enough time for you to provide. I mean, I know Moodle and it could take forever to talk about <laughs> sure. all the things you could do with it. So maybe that's something that you can address in the text. It that does be. sound interesting sure. to integrate that with Moodle. Okay. Well, thank you, Andrew, so much. That was a thank wonderful you. presentation. Thanks, so. As a as a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org, which is our will be our closing statements by our fearless leader. Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 17 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and explore the Hypergrid Tour resources in OSCC Expo 2 region along with sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. And thank you again to our speaker and you, our audience. And don't go away. We have more briefly coming up right now. Thank you.